I'm in Psalm 1. This, is, little, this will be my plan. I, I'm preaching this in a church that's not my own church um, on this Sunday. So I, and, and, I, and I will confess to you, it's not, the sermon's not done. <laughs> Um, so you're catching me in medias race, uh, so we'll have to kind of think through this, and you'll help me, so I'll, be, I'll look forward to that. My, my plan is to talk a little bit about the text itself, um, and then work through some sort of theological, homiletical reflections attendant to it. So that, and that'll just maybe let you see a little bit of, of the process of my own, my own thought on this. Let me, let me take an aerial view for a second. Um, some of you have had me in class where I've talked about this, some of you have not, and I can't plot where all of you all are in all of this. But can we take a macro view of the Psalter just for a few, few minutes? Um, th this is, for those of you who've had me, what I would say is an attendance to canonical shape. All right, so I'm gonna write this up here. Canonical shape. Uh, the Psalter's not been put together haphazardly. There's some kind of intent behind it. It's not always self-evident what that intent entails. I think it's open to a lot of different reading strategies, but the shaping itself, I think, is pretty a standard fare. If you have your Bible and you see, for example, Psalms 1 through 41, you'll see um, Book 1, okay? And then when you get to Psalms 42 through 72, you get to book uh, two. I know this is, uh, and a lot of you have engaged this before. Um, I, again, I'm just going to throw a lot of spaghetti at the wall. I think Psalm 72 moving into book three at Psalm 73 um, is the hinge of the whole Psalter. No, it's, it's Janus-faced. Psalm 73 looks back to these sort of Davidic promises of book 1 and 2. Uh, Psalm 73, verse 1, surely God is good to Israel. Oh, wait, Webster did Psalm 73, didn't he? Okay, I need to be quiet. He's already done all that. Okay, so I think Psalm 73 is crucial to the book. It looks back and it looks forward to the problems of book 3. Then you get to book 4, which is 90 through 106. And then 107 through 150 is book five, all right? Um, so a couple of things with this. There are some who will read into this a kind of microcosm of um, Israel's complicated history vis-a-vis -vis the Davidic covenant. You know, so you have sort of an emphasis on Davidic Psalms here that's complicated in the darkness of book three. Um, Psalm 72, the last verse of Psalm 72 says, uh, now the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, have come to an end. That's a little bit of a, a Houston, we've got a problem moment. Like you just flip a few pages and there are some more David psalms. So it seems on an, from an editorial standpoint that that's intentionally there providing a kind of theological clue to what's going on in the book three. Book three can get broody and dark. Um, the only lament psalm, lugubrious is the term that uh, I like to, the lugubrious book three. Um, psalm 88 is the only psalm in the Psalter that doesn't end in praise. It ends with these harrowing words, and the darkness was my closest friend, period. Next, he's like, right? Um, and then you move into book four, which others will argue is the theological heartbeat of the Psalter. Um, New Anglican types and Wesleyan types will recognize the Psalms like Psalm 95, the Venita, O come and let us worship. Beginning at Psalm 95 to Psalm 100, what you have there emphasized is coming into the royal court of the king. So the Lord is the king. Psalm 100, I remember this from my you know, fundamentalist bar mitzvah days. You know, like, so you had to learn Psalm 100. Then you got your Schofield Bible. I mean, you're kind of getting in. Um, you know, Psalm 100, uh, um, worship the Lord, come into his presence with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. All that language is royal. Psalm 98, sing to the Lord a new song. Why? Because he's coming 
The Lord is returning. Well, what's he returning to do? As a king to bring judgment and equity to the land. So when you move from Davidic promises, complication of the Davidic covenant, think exile if you want a historical thing to kind of hang your hat on there, into an emphasis on the Lord as the king, uh, Psalm 90, Psalms 95 to 100, and then to, to Psalm 107 to 50 is where the clutch gets released and the Psalter moves us, as Gregory of Nyssa would say, toward our eschatological destination. As you're, you, when you look at the Psalms and its five-book structure, you see something of a mirror of the course of the Christian existence that's moving toward unending and unfettered praise. It's, it's, really, it's the kind of thing that can make you know, um, people who like traditional worship, I'm one of them, uh, a little bit nervous because there's lots, lots of symbols and the things you all like, symbols and flutes and trumpets, and, and, uh, and, and it's, but it's there and it's loud and it's unceasing, and it's repetitive. I mean, you know Alistair Begg's um, famous definition of a praise song is a one word, two notes, three hours. Um, I, I thought this was interesting. When I, I was reading in Chronicles recently on the, on the dedication of the temple from Solomon, um, do you, I, I'm making an argument for praise choruses, by the way. Do you, do you know what this, this, the praise that they sang there? The Lord is good. His mercy lasts forever again and again and again and again. Um, so that, that's where we move. There, there's a reason, for example, in Dante's Divine Comedy, when you move from the, the Inferno to the Purgatorio and then finally to the Paradiso, and there's Beatrice kind of leading him along the way. And en route, he looks to his side, getting to the heavenly throne room, and Beatrice is now gone. She's, wisdom has gone as far as she can go. And then um, Dante describes getting closer to the divine throne room in terms of music. It's hard to describe, he says, it's hard to describe what I'm hearing. Um, that's, again, that's an indication of, the, of our whole of our lives moving toward praise. It's why the Hebrew Psalter, I mean, the Hebrew canon defines or, or titles Psalms as tehalim, a halal, praise, even though you all know that if you did a quantitative analysis of the Psalter, you'd find more lament psalms than praise psalms. You know, even that has its own kind of move toward um, unending and unceasing praise. So in the Psalter, this is kind of an aerial view. This larger sort of, of five-book structure says a few things to us. Sorry, I just stepped in front of your... Uh, <laughs> uh, says a few things to us. Number one... It gives us, and, and this is, again, my own sort of hermeneutical strategy here, in figural representation, what the Christian existence is through all of its complexity and where we're moving. To live is to praise, to praise is to live. We were made to praise. You cannot read the first two paragraphs of St. Augustine's Confessions too many times. Just read it over and over and over. We were made, oh, I like Sarah Rudin's new translation, we were made, O oh Master, to praise you. You've called us to praise. We're restless until we find rest in you. But what does that rest look like? It's unending, unceasing, unyielding praise, which is not an act of self-discovery. It's a release from the tyranny of our therapeutic moment for him. That's where real freedom is to be found. And the Bible is telling us in the canonical shape of the Psalter that that's what we were made for, and it's what we're destined for eschatologically. And every once in a while along the way, we get little lightning flashes of what eternity will be in time. That, that's God's kindness to us. That, so that's number one. Number two, and again, this is a little bit, um, you know, third grade Sunday school here, but the five books of the Psalter also indicate for us and mirror for us the five books of the Pentateuch. That's, it's not an example that there's this mimetic correspondence at the seams. I'm going to come back to this in a second. But at the seams of the Tanakh, Right? So you have Torah, you have the, I'm going to shorten this, the Nevi'im, the prophets, and then the Ketuvim, the writings. Here you have um, Psal the Psalms as the first book of the writings. There's some debate on this, but I'm just going to assert it. First book of the writings, reflecting for us the canonical shape of the Torah. Now that's another important feature, I think, of the Psalms' canonical shape and intentionality. There they're not merely human words to God. I like Calvin. Calvin. Calvin's reading of the Psalms is 
kind of is the most anthropological of all readings. Uh, what are the Psalms? They're the anatomy of all the parts of our souls. I'm fine with that. But they're not merely that. It's, it's also instruction. It's Torah. Um, it's authorization. Uh, if I can use a southern colloquialism, we're being learned in the Psalms. We're being taught how to speak. We're being authorized for speech. Um, and I think of the Psalms sort of metaphorically like garments, um, bathrobes in a closet, right? Um, in other words, if you might not be in lament mode right now, but when you find yourself in lament mode, there's a bathrobe waiting for you to put on with some language that fits just right for you to articulate words to God even in your distress, and the Psalms as Torah authorize you to do so. Um, you might be dripping wet, not now you might not be, but at some point in time you might be dripping wet outside of the deep end of the pool, and God has redeemed you from your distress. He, he, is, he has saved you in a moment of real despair, and you've seen His salvation. There's a psalm like Psalm 40, a Thanksgiving psalm, waiting for you. You find yourself in the clutches of sin again, there are psalms waiting for you. Psalm 32, Psalm 51. Um, so the psalms are Torah, they're instruction. God is He's speaking to us. He's shaping us in a pattern and a mode of existence before Him. I've shared this illustration before with some of you, so forgive me for repeating, but when my wife and I were first married, we went to a marriage retreat. Um, Ted Tripp was the speaker. And uh, Tripp, Tripp said, um, and we, we fought a lot our first two years of marriage. I, mean, I don't know if any of you have had any of those issues in your marriage, but we, we kind of fought some. Um, I would win some, I would say, uh, some, but not all of them. Um, and I can remember we went, so we, in other words, we, when you do premarital counseling, you, I mean, you don't know what in the world you're doing. I mean, you don't know anything. But when you're married and now you're fighting and you're kind of wrestling, then you go to marriage retreats with your ears really perked up. We went. And Tripp said, um, one of the worst things that you can do in your marriage is to give your spouse the silent treatment. I remember thinking, I can give you five things worse right now than that. <laughs> Um, but his, his, point, his point was, and I think there's something to this, the opposite of love, we all know this is not hate, it's, it's indifference. Um, because indifference, which is the relative of the silent treatment, indifference communicates to the other that your existence right now to me really doesn't matter. Whether you're here or whether you're not, you, you, you don't exist. That's for Tripp, and I think he's really right on dangerous territory in relationships, very dangerous territory. And if the Psalms are Torah, again, I think that's what they are communicating to us in all of their variety and their vagary, is that God wants us not giving Him the silent treatment in any of the moments of our lives that await us in the future. No silent treatment. That's Torah. It's instruction. Now, what about Psalms 1 and 2? I'm narrowing into my psalm, don't worry. Psalm, psalms 1 and 2... Um, function like instruction manuals before you get into the river of prayer. Um, if you look at Psalm 3, you got your Bibles here, look Psalm 3, Psalm 4, how, they all start with the language of invocation. The vocative is used. Answer me, O Lord. O Lord, hear me in my distress. O Lord, O Lord, that's the language of prayer. Psalms 1 and 2 are not given to us in the language of prayer. They're given to, uh, to us in what we might consider didactic form. They're teaching us something. Um, if I can appeal to Jer uh, Jerome. Jerome, uh, in his reflections on the Psalms, said that the Psalms are a large house with all kinds of different rooms, and the Holy Spirit is your only guide to navigate all those rooms, and Psalm 1 is the front door. All right. So these first two Psalms here are instruction before you get into the wild river. Um, I use this illustration in my Hebrew class, so forgive me, I'm going to do it again. Um, I, when I was a youth director for five years, I know that's hard to believe, but it, it, it is true. Um, for five years, we took a group of teenagers, my wife and I were just married, uh, white water rafting on the Okoe River. Um, the Okoe River, I don't know if it's still this way, but back then, you didn't go down the Okoe River by yourself. You always had to have a guide. And uh, I, I can remember that we had some, I don't know, 21, 22-year-old co-ed on the side of the river giving us these instructions. Here, you know, life jackets on, helmet, paddle. And she's like, when I say left, you paddle left. And we're like, yes, ma'am. 
when I paddle right, you say, when I say right, you paddle right. So we, we had, and then we got in the boat and went for the, the that's, that's Psalm 1 and 2. So, Psalm 1 and 2 are standing on the riverbanks before you get into this wild ride of the complicated and variegated life before the living God and all of its ups and its downs. Before you get into that river, let me, um, let me give you some instruction. Or, or can I put it in? I'm going to continue to beat metaphors here. Uh, Psalms 1 and 2 are the conditions, the fertile soil for the conditions of a faithful life lived before God. You got So in other words, Psalm 1 and 2 you got to go to again and again. And, and if you, you can see this here, they come, um, gosh, the time's going fast. They come as a package. Look at the first word um, of Psalm 1. How blessed is the man. And then if you look at the end of Psalm 2, someone, you have your Bible here? I'll, I'll just read it. The end of Psalm 2 says, How blessed are all those who take refuge in Him. All right, so we've got a question before us here in Psalm 1 and 2 about the blessed state. That's for you Hebrew people out there. Eshrei. So the question is raised before us here, what does it mean uh, to, be, to be blessed? Well, let's talk about this for a little bit in Psalm 1 and, then, and the ending of Psalm, Psalm 2. Number one, blessed or happy, not a bad translation, by the way, is an exclamatory sense. Uh, truly happy. How rewarding uh, the life for the person who dot, dot, dot. Now, we need to think about this a little bit because happiness is not necessarily the emotion of happiness or joy per se, or euphoria. We could say that's a byproduct, but it's not at its core. Um, it speaks, and if I can use the way the scriptures describes this, to the blessed state of knowing that the smile of God rests on you. It speaks to a state, and here's like, it seems to be the million dollar catchphrase of our time, of knowing where you as a human being can flourish and grow into what God wants for you. It's an invitation to all of the challenges of human existence. It offers no um, Buddhist escape, but it does so with the confidence of knowing that you've settled basic first principles. Um, this is why Psalm 1's been meaningful to me over the last year. I'll get kind of a little personal. One of our graduates was in my office um, in the early spring, a fellow named Jonathan Bales. He serves a church, Anglican Parish in Texas. Um, Jonathan and I were sitting in an office and just catching up, chatting, yada, yada. And, and kind of out of nowhere, um, he said, you know, it's interesting in my, in my teaching in the church, I find myself returning um, to basic first principles again. And, and it caught me at an interesting moment because I feel like, for me, I, I have been returning to some basic first principles too. The kind of things that you think you get sorted out in your 20s and your 30s theologically only to ascend more and more into newer heights, finding out that, you know what, I need to go back to visit the, the foundation again, the basic principles again. I, say, I have a son that plays baseball, and I'll, and I'll tell him this regularly. Um, listen, the major league players every year in the spring training, do you know what they're doing, the infielders? A ground ball inside of the left foot, play through it to first base hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times because they're, they're working on the fundamentals of the game. Um, Psalm 1 is an invitation back to basic first principles of Christian existence. They're raising the fundamental, it's raising the fundamental question that all of us have, namely, is life worth living? And if it is worth living, how is life lived well? That, that's the question that's been asked Forever. I mean, Aristotle, right? Where's eudaimonia really to be found? Well, it's found for Aristotle in attendance to the virtuous life. Well, how do you learn the virtuous life? You habituate yourself into certain practices and you just get smarter. That's kind of Aristotle's answer. 
Um, the Bible's not uninterested in the question about human fulfillment and purpose and significance and joy and destiny. It raises that question. And it does so as a matter of first principles, and it's going to tell you here in Psalm 1 what the, who the blessed person actually is. Who's the blessed person? The best blessed person is one, and it goes negative first, right? Doesn't walk, doesn't stand, doesn't sit with the wicked, with sinners, with mockers. If we had time, we could talk about all of those. Rasha, uh, sinners, negative behavior. Um, their own person reveals inner disharmony and unrest that lends itself to unrest and disharmony in the community. Oh. Um, chata, sin, that's that falling short. And then the creme de la creme, right, and the, and the triad here is the mocker, the letzim. Um, in, the, in the book of Proverbs, the letzim is the antithesis, the antipode of the wise. This is worth looking at, Proverbs 21, 24. I want to read this one to you. It's, it's, it lets you know who the mockers are. The proud and the arrogant person, Letzim is his name. Mocker is his name. Uh, Proverbs uh, 22, verse 10. Listen to this description of the mocker. Drive out the mocker, and out go strife. Quarrels and insults all come to an end. So you get this sense of deep unrest, um, communal disorder. As much as we might like to think that we're islands, I think someone wrote a song about this one time, um, unto ourselves we are not. And we never sin in isolation. It always has an impact on the community. So here you have the blessed person is the one that recognizes that particular road toward disorder and disharmony in attendance to falling short of, a, of, of linking oneself in submission to God's law and the communal unrest that that lends itself toward, and the happy person shuns all that. I don't want to go down that road. And then it goes into the positive. But their delight is in the law of the Lord. And I just have to tell you as a Bible teacher who pays the mortgage talking about this stuff, I'm so glad that delight came before meditate. It's there, and we're going to get to it. But delight, chafatz, this is, this is a term that, that elicits feelings of deep pleasure and affection, right? Um, th th this means it makes you smile when you think about it. They delight um, in what? They delight in the law of the Lord, the Torah Adonai. And this is worth reflecting on here because Torah here, and we know that the whole Psalms are shaped as Torah too, is not to be reduced to the legal capacity of God's revelation. Um, it is that, and it entails that, positively so, I should say, but it can't be reduced to that. I think we could talk about Torah like Psalm 19 does in a panoply of ways to just understand it in terms of God's instruction, God's speech. Can we put it in a broad theological category, God's revelation. Their, their affections are ignited when they think about God's Word. They're hungry for God. They know that that group over there, with all of its disrest and, and lack of harmony and discord and chaos, are not under the creative over, overwhelming uh, uh, viewpoint of God's Word, Genesis 1, 1 through 3. They're in chaos. But the blessed one ordered Right, set in his affections toward the Lord, that one, this delight, is in the law of the Lord. He, um, he, he and she are excited about it. it. It fills them with joy to think about it. Great illustration of this, Reb Tevia, the great theologian Reb Tevia, and Filler on the Roof. Right, he's slapping that corn around, and if I were a rich man, right, stomping, chickens going, and donkeys over here, just love it. And uh, the whole song is a big, you know, fun roller coaster ride of exuberance and reflection. But there's one point where he gets really pensive. And he sits down, and the music kind of slows, and 
Reb Tevye says, and if I were a rich man, the greatest thing of all is that I could spend all day in the synagogue discussing Torah with the rabbis. That would be the best thing of it all. Um, that's Psalm 1, 2, right? The delight is in God's word. Do you, you know what's implied by this as well? The implication of Psalm 1 is that the blessed person enjoying the smile of God, entering into the conditions for human faithfulness, the blessed person recognizes that they are not their own best resource. I mean, how quick we are in our therapeutic age to turn to ourselves as our own best resource. We are not our own best resource. The person that's been unleashed in their affection living in the smile of God, recognizes that I am not my best resource, and I will attune my affection and my sweat equity meditation to God's Word. That's where I'm going to turn. Again, when I'm tempted to turn inward, I'm going to be forced outward to Christ and His Word, because that's the blessed state. So you see the affections here, along with meditating, which is kind of a fun onomatopoetic word, haga, right? So if you were uh, watching... National Geographic and some lion just jumped on a, on a gazelle and has its mouth buried in the side of that gazelle and the blood's all over the mouth. And, and if you saw that you know 200-yard uh, uh, lens zooming in and you could hear what that lion was doing, this is what he's doing. Haga, 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 haga. He's chewing, right? That you, that's in the lexicon, by the way. Not, not that description, but something like it. The cooing of the dove. The, what, what a lion does with its prey, you're, you're chewing on it. And do you notice the figure of speech here, the merism, right? Two opposites to show something in its totality, day and night. Um, Deuteronomy 6, when your children ask you, what do all these laws mean? Uh, tell them that we were slaves in Egypt and, and tell it to them when you're walking along the way and when you're, and when you're out in the field and when you're on your way to the ball game. This is the Eugene Peterson paraphrase on that. When you're on your way to the ball game and, Wherever you are, um, you day and night reflect on God's law. And then how does it go on? The, w the way in which it continues to go is, and you know this, that, that's, that's where genuine prosperity and shalom and success are to be found. Now, one of the reasons why Psalm 73 is so fascinating to read it canonically is Psalm 73 is, in effect, Asaph saying, I gave Psalm 1 a go and it's not working out for me. All right, so the... One of the things I love about the Psalter, and especially the writings of the Old Testament, is they're honest about the challenges of real human experience and our confessions of faith. They let you live into that tension, resolving it more often than not eschatologically. Um, but let, let me stop here, and let me just give you a, kind of a few um, reflections on this. Number one, Jesus Christ is the embodiment of verses 1 through 3. If you get a chance to read St. Augustine on Psalm 1, do so. He is the fruitful tree. If we follow Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, who if you're a beast, you have to, I guess, uh, right? Now, if you follow Bonhoeffer, I had one of these sort of fortuitous moments. I was walking the stacks, pulled off one of the collected volumes, the blue volumes, and found a lecture, a thinking vault of the lecture on the Psalms that I'd never seen before. And in that lecture, Bonhoeffer says, when you're reading the Psalms, how about try this practice? Put the psalm on the lips of Jesus before you put it on your own lips. Just give that a try. It's actually a remarkable exercise. Um, St. Augustine says no one can say Psalm 1 fully and completely other than Christ. So, so this recognize that for you and for me, the blessed state is a derivative one, or it's one of union and proximity in Him. Um, we, know, we know vicariously He was Psalm 1 for us. So that's Now, by the way, that does not then, you know, release the clutch, and no, we no longer think about our own agency with this. That's not the claim. But it's a proper ordering of how our agency even functions in light of our union with Christ. So Psalms, Psalm 1 um, is properly put on the lips of Christ, and it invites us back to His Word and to His instruction for the sake of our joy and our wholeness. Sola Scriptura, going into that season of Reformation memory, is a claim for the sufficiency of the Bible to render the truths of our salvation and to give us a clear path for navigating life before God, others, and the world in light of Christ's person and work. 
And there are so many diversions along the way. We're living in a time of deep disorientation. I think about this as a dad. I've got three teenage boys now. God help us. Young people are detaching themselves, for example, from their own bodies in pursuit of pleasure or some identity. Our moorings are untethered. We are adrift. The evil one is having a field day. Um, Can I, I, I'm not a great C.S. Lewis person. I wish I was. I'm kind of coming to Lewis later in life. But I will tell you the book of his that I do return to often is the Screwtape Letters. I I think there's a genius in that. In fact, what Lewis can be described in the Screwtape Letters is a theologian of pleasure because you have the uncle uh, Screwtape, the, the great mentor demon, Who's, who's mentoring his nephew Wormwood and helping him trip up this new neophyte in the faith. And one of the things that he says regularly through there is, hey, listen, when we deal with the realm of pleasure, true human pleasure, we're on the enemy's territory, says the demon, not our own. That's God's territory. We can only be parasitic to it. We could never really experience the thing in its true form. And so listen to what he says, right? So he says, so listen, this is good, good advice for all of us, Lord help us. G- get this young man, the young man they're going after, get him to like talking about the books that he's read and not really enjoying reading. In fact, I just love, you got to love that, right? Um, Alan Jacob says, a lot of us like to say that we have read. I was kind of like that when I was a young seminary student. I knew that I got to read Calvin's Institutes. Check, right? And now I can tell everybody what? I've read Calvin's Institutes. Check, right? Um, any of you seen Woody Allen's movie, uh, Match Point? I'm not commending it. Um, but uh, there's a scene in there where this young man is making his way up into the aristocracy of a London family that's high and sort of in business, and, and they're a highly in, in, intelligent family. He's coming, he's about to marry their daughter. Their dinner table conversation is so intense and high level that he can't keep up. He's a smart kid, but he's never been around this before. There's a scene in the movie that I think is so telling where you find the young man in his bed at night. No music, no script, no nothing. All you see is him under the lamp reading, are you ready for this? The Cambridge Companion to Dostoevsky. Don't you love that? He's not reading the Brothers Karamazov or the Gambler or the Idiot. or the, He's not reading any of that. He's reading the Cambridge Companion. Why? So that at the dinner party tomorrow night, he'll have something intelligent to say. And Uncle Screwtape says, got him, right? Got him. That's parasitic pleasure. He says, turn him into a food critic. Sexuality is a big one. All this stuff is parasitic on true pleasure. Because genuine happiness, genuine human flourishing, only can flow from the reality that's promised to us in Psalm chapter 1, turning us back to our Christ and turning us back to his word. These are the first principles that we have to attend to again and again. Back to the Lord, back to his word, back to the truths of the gospels, back to the green pastures where true happiness is to be found. Okay, I talked enough. Y'all want to bat this around a little bit? Thank you, Dr. Genelette. Uh, A quick plug here. Uh, In his sermons, John Wesley uses the couplet holiness and happiness more than 190 times. Is that right? Yeah. Holiness and happiness. Yeah, he does. Probably stole it from Calvin. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Alex is going to handle the mic. Who would like to ask a question, make a comment quickly? Don't jump off that once. Dr. Ginellette. Yeah. How should we think about prosperity in Psalm 1 and in, with the a, with a Hebrew mind? Yeah, it's good. It's one, um, uh, let me make a, a commendation to you that I, I was actually kind of looking at it even today. Um, Bruce Walke and James Houston put together, have put together a couple of books on the Psalms so that you have an Old Testament exegete kind of reading with the theologian. And... It's not um, exhaustive of the Psalter, but um, the Psalms that they do engage are pretty fruitful. I've actually been kind of surprised at how good they are. Um, 
And they raise this question. Like the blessed state, um, which the Psalms invite us into, cannot be that which is absent suffering. Too, too, too many, too many. So, so in other words, we have to be talking about something deeper and more than euphoria or what we consider to be prosperity. That's, that's number one. So we've got to have, and maybe I'm struggling with my own, the limitations of my own metaphors and, and language to kind of get at this, but it's got to be something deeper. Um, uh, may, maybe the ways in which Kierkegaard distinguishes between juvenile love, which is kind of this sort of puppy thing on the surface, which is a lot of fun, I remember those days, and true sort of marital love that sustains you to the graveside of the one that you're married to. There's a depth there that really goes beyond any descriptions of euphoria. It's something almost transcendent. I mean, I think that's what you're getting at. Um, so I, I would want to say that, number one. And number two, this is where Psalm 73 and Psalm 1 become interesting psalms to read in connection with one another. Um, our, our ultimate prosperity is promised to us eschatologically. I mean, th this is where theological reading is really important. I believe in the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. That is, that's the whole game. Um, and that's what happens. And when you think about the Psalms and the psalmist describing their despair or disorientation and then being released from that, right, but I have trusted in your unfailing love, the Psalms never speak of that in terms of the alleviation of their circumstances. Um, the Psalms speak about that as the reorientation of their perspective in the divine and a kind of eschatological forward-looking. So I think that that's where, I mean, if, if this world is all we've got, and I, Calvin can be a little dyspeptic, I will admit that. The guy struggled with hemorrhoids, so you've got to give him a break. Um, but Calvin was good in the, in the golden rule in the instance where he said, hey, sometimes God will actually, well, this is, this is Christianity one, uh, 703, um, sometimes God will give you difficult children, not the children that you wanted, um, because he wants you to know that this world is not all that it is. Or he might let you have a marriage that's a challenge, just to let you know that you can't put all your stock and hope in this world. We're both indigenous and we're pilgrims at the same time. And I think that's where the Psalms kind of eschatologically are moving us. So prosperity has to be shaped eschatologically. If it's rooted completely in the now and, and not the not yet, then that's what I would call an overly realized eschatology. And Paul's got a lot to say about that, too. Brother Schnupp. Um, in terms of the kind of canonical framing that, I'm, that you like to do, in terms of going to the sermon, <laughs> um, which I love, you know, it's not, you know, but... Um, especially in a context thinking like somewhere you haven't been before, do you find yourself in guest scenarios doing a lot of that? And if so, how, especially in a sermon? Oh, in a sermon. That's a good question. I mean, in, in class settings, for sure, uh, in a sermon, insofar as it aids, and maybe that you got Jenelette today, Dr. Pasquarello could put you in a very different direction. I don't want to try to do too much in a sermon. I think sermons go off track when they try um, to get at all the meat that's there. I think there's something both constraining and liberating when you recognize that texts can always do more, um, and, and it's okay to settle on one aspect of this, and that's, that's plenty. Okay, I'm going to say something that's going to get me in trouble. A lot of 45-minute sermons that I've heard are three sermons. Now, if it's 45-minute sermon like a Jonathan Edwards sermon, you know, where like you get one verse and you're, I mean, I, I get that people can do that. But a lot of times it's, it's just, a, it's a little much. Um, now, classes, this is where I think Christian education and the pulpit are so important to, to wed to one another because then I don't have to turn the pulpit into an overly didactic moment. I'm not opposed to that. I'll do didactic stuff in the pulpit, but only insofar as it serves whatever this thing is that we're after. Whatever, what, what I think is that th this text is pressuring me toward these five things, but I'm going to go with one and two because that's sufficient for a sermon, and everything that I say needs to be in service of that. Otherwise, it just becomes 
So I, I, I would say it just depends. It would just depend. Like, I don't think I'm going to go Sunday morning, and t- this is a Presbyterian church. Now, I don't think I'll go in there and talk about the five-book structure thing. Yeah. I don't think so. But I will say about, but I will say Psalm 1 and 2 are the entry, entry gate into this whole mm-hmm. wild river. I will, I will use that. We're always selecting. I mean, I, I was telling my son's doing college applications, and he, and he got one written, and I said, you've not, I mean, he didn't like hearing this, but the real writing is in the editing. I mean, we all know that, and 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 I've got co- like colleagues who love it. I, I don't love editing. I like to write and kind of move on. But the real writing is done in the editing, and the hard work in writing and I think in in, in sermon making is having the courage to cut even your good stuff for the sake of what your what what the aim and the intent is. That's hard because a lot of us don't have that many good thoughts. I mean, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta gotta go with what you got, but. Save it for another sermon.